Hi everyone and welcome to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder and welcome back to the show where we dig deeper to understand what matters most in business. We are coming to you live today from the brand new RVN television studios and this is episode number 200 of Behind the Numbers. So thank you out there for your continued support. And I couldn't be happier to have as my guest for episode number 200 than Devin Bailey. Devin's a friend, former colleague. He is an executive and relational coach and author of the book, How to Escape from Prison. Not that kind of escape. Hey, Devin, how are you? Oh, wonderful. Thank you for, for having me today. And I just want to acknowledge you. 200 episodes is no joke, my man. What a huge amount of impact and value you've given to your listeners. And I'm honored to be here today. Well, thank you. It's been a lot of fun. And I can only give the big shout out to the folks at RVN Television for giving me the platform to have these kinds of, kinds of conversations. So thank you, everyone. Uh, Devin, I want to talk a little bit about your background and set the frame for the audience as to how you got to where you are and what, what you're up to when we talk about executive and relational coach, because you're doing some interesting things, as I understand it, in kind of marrying a, a traditional executive coaching program, but you're bringing in elements of what I would call couples therapy, if you That's will, right. because the couples therapy piece really relates back to how you interact with folks in the office. But I want you to explain that better than I just did. You actually explained it pretty well. So uh, what I've realized as I got more and more into executive coaching and I'm working with, we'll call them leaders, specifically in professional services, because that's a whole special kind of blend of stress that we get, where we've got client pressures and internal pressures. What I realized is that everything is a relationship, whether it's someone who's, I'll call them a subordinate, whether it's someone who's a peer, someone you're reporting to, everything is a relationship. Right. And whilst we focus a lot if we're that way inclined on improving the quality of and the connection with our intimate relationships. I hate to say it, but we probably spend more time, or at least the same amount of time, with our colleagues and our friends as we do with our spouse or spousal equivalent. For sure. So I thought to myself, well, of all the things here that I'm studying and learning that are helping me grow in my, in my friendships, my family life and my relationship, my, my intimate relationships, what from there can I take to actually help people build and forge stronger relationships at work? And honestly, the, the parallels are, are huge and the benefits are enormous because at the end of the day, like I said, everything's a relationship. And if we can understand what's going on inside of us and how and why people are reacting the way they are in certain situations with us, we can actually build rapport, we can build trust. Mm -hmm. And call me crazy, Dave, if we get on with people we work with and we enjoy our work, doesn't that eliminate some of the stress and we end up actually wanting to go to work? Yeah, for sure. And look, it's, it's a balancing act, right? So if you're, if you're balanced and, and doing well on the home front with those relationships, in theory, you show up as a better self at work and vice versa. Yeah, for sure. And if you can take what you learn from doing a better job of home relationships to your work relationships, it's a double whammy and you get to actually show up in a way you want to in your life as a whole. So it's yeah. more balanced. So you've said something I, I jotted down here that and the episode title is building better leaders by building better humans. There's a lot to unpack there, Devin. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to wind the clock back a little bit to explain how on earth I got into executive coaching and now why I do this unusual blend of executive and relational coaching. So I was in a big professional services firm for 15 years, doing the usual, climbing the corporate ladder as fast as I could, trying to prove I'm worth it, good enough, you, you know the, the usual situation. And I, I went through an experience personally that I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy. We'll use the term breakdown just because I don't have a better way to explain it, but it was a, a psychological break. I, I reached the, the bottom, if you like, and I was in a vegetative state for 24 hours. It was a full-on meltdown. Mm. And I realized as a result of that, that I needed to do things differently. And that perhaps trying to exceed unreasonable expectations, prove I'm worthy, do better than the next guy. Perhaps that wasn't working for me. And it got me for the first time to think a little bit differently and stop trying to master the external game and start thinking about, you know, maybe it's me. And I had this profound realization that if I wanted my life to change, maybe I needed to change. And that got me into, we'll call it personal development, spiritual development, and ultimately relational development. So that's how I got into coaching and I left right. the professional services world and I now help the people who are still in that world navigate the demands of that career with ease. You had an aha moment with 
awareness, the, the self-awareness and understanding that if things were going to change, you had to start with you. How often do you see people having those epiphanies? I do pretty often. The sad part is it generally only comes when they reach a breaking point of some kind. I think in life, whatever it is, whether it's our physical health, whether it's how we look, whether it's a relationship, we all have a threshold. And I think once we breach that threshold, we suddenly say, I'm not willing to tolerate it anymore. So I do see it quite often. Yeah. Well, certainly I see it with all the clients I'm working with. Otherwise, yeah. why would they have but, come But they've got, to, they've got to reach that so-called breaking point. And I kind of wish that didn't have to happen. And yet it actually drives the impetus for change. Oh, yeah, for sure. But they, they have to know they're on a path that is not going to end well. But yet there's some kind of psychological resistance, reluctance yeah. to, to make the change. Yeah, it comes back to programming, if you yeah. think about it. And, and if someone you know, said to me, what is at the core of everything you do? And as much as you may roll your eyes at this, it comes down to self-esteem and boundaries. Like, honestly, that's it. Uh, without wishing to paint a cynical picture, people like me, and I'm a, a self-labeled insecure overachiever, basically we grew up in this performance-driven society believing that we were insignificant, unimportant, etc. And for whatever reason, we chose the corporate world as a place to go to validate our existence. That's never going to end well, Dave. Because I don't know about you, but there's never enough success or money or cars or houses or accolades to fill that void. Right. But for me, it took 15 years of pain to a breaking point for me to realize, oh, I'm playing the game the wrong way around. Whoops. And those are the people that I work with, those who are on their way up and starting to think there's got to be a better way. Like, yeah. really? Let, let's, let's dig deeper into the self-esteem and uh, boundaries theme here for a second. Talk about why they're related. So let's think about, uh, most people I think when we talk about boundaries think um, someone invites you out for, uh, for dinner and you don't really want to go but you're afraid to say no. Like you've got you know, to have a boundary with that person and say no. I would argue that's more of a standard, that's more of a boundary in action. For me the boundary is more energetic. So I think we, we have an inner boundary and it, it's kind of like an orange skin. There's two, there's two sides to it. The outer layer, the actual orange skin, is what I call the protecting boundary. Okay. And then the inner layer, the pith, is what I call the containing boundary. So the point is, picture someone who, oh, I had this happen recently, they cut me off in traffic and then yelled at me and flipped me the bird. And I thought to my, and I laughed. And I thought to myself, hang on, I'm the one that was, that, that was done wrong and you're mad at me, but my protecting boundary stopped the negativeness coming in. It bounced off because I knew that wasn't about me. Silly example, but that's what a protecting boundary is. It's not just saying no when you, when you want to say no. It's about understanding that that negative energy, if you like, that's out there, you only let in what's true for you. And if you let in what's not true for you and you take it personally, that hurts your esteem. Yeah. And you have a tendency to take it in and take it personally when you have low self-esteem. So they're inherently linked. Interesting. I mean, I'm simplifying it wildly, but that, you asked for the linkage. Yeah, no, and I think everybody can relate to the, uh, the incident. Being, yeah. <laughs> Big car in traffic. Yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely. Uh, so, Devin, we've got just about a couple of minutes to go here before we've got to take a commercial break. But I want you to tell everybody a little bit about the book where they can get it, and how they can reach you if they want to learn more about you or work with you. Great. So the book, How to Escape from Prison, is all about the internal prison, obviously. The internal prison that I created of trying to meet expectations, etc. Um, so the best place to get it is go to Amazon and search for it. You'll find it, How to Escape from Prison by Devin Bailey. Uh, and if you want to find out more about me, go to devinbailey.com. In fact, we have a shiny new website that just launched, so you can read and understand a lot more in depth about what we do. Um, otherwise, look me up on LinkedIn. Sounds good. Devin, you sit tight. Don't go anywhere. You watching and listening at home, don't go anywhere either. We will be right back after this quick commercial break.
pleased with yourself. Not to brag, but I just switched to Verizon. So you got an awesome network. And when I switched, I got to choose the phone I wanted for free, not bragging. You're bragging. Oh, he's bragging. Who, me? Never. Oh, excuse me. Hello, your royal highness, sir. OK, that's a brag. Hey, Mom, I got to call you back. Switch and choose the phone you want, like the incredible iPhone 14 on us. On the network worth bragging about. Verizon. And welcome back to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and today we're talking about how to build better leaders by building better humans with my friend and former colleague, Devin Bailey. Devin, welcome back to round two here on Behind the Numbers. And I want to jump right in with that as the topic for conversation, building better leaders by building better humans. How do we do that? What are the characteristics of great leaders and great humans? So the first thing I would say is it's different for everyone. And the fact that I say that rather than giving you a five point model or a seven point scale is because it's about being self-reflective. You've got to sit back and say, well, what does it mean for the people I work with? What does it mean for my family? What does it mean for me? And there's an important point there. We're not just a leader in an organization. We might be a leader in a family. We're also a leader of ourselves. So for me, if I had to define a leader, it's someone who has the ability to move themselves and others into action. And in any given day, in any given moment, the way you do that is going to change. So I think the best leaders are those who have a very clear understanding of themselves and, frankly, human behavior as a whole, and they know the people they work with very well. I think it comes back to being reflective of self mm -hmm. and being reflective of the people you're with. I mean, human interaction, human behavior, human communication is not only complex, it's nuanced. Oh, for sure. We know that, so yeah. there is no one size fits all. And I think that as a starting point makes you a better leader to stop and say, why is so-and-so saying that? What's really going on? Yeah, tone, body language. Yeah, yeah. There's, when you talk about nuance, there's a lot of nuance. Yeah. And within that nuance is a great opportunity either to really get it right or really misread it. Totally. So, so, so how, do we, how do we discern the difference and, and do the work to figure that out? Well, I think there are fundamental frameworks that we need to go out there and, and frankly study. And these, are, these are, are, I would call, pillars of the work we do with our clients. One of them is around human needs. And there's a ton of different frameworks around it. We have, we have our own where we think there are seven. And to understand what's going on within yourself and why you act in certain ways and within someone else helps you be more understanding. Uh, for instance, if someone is significance driven, you know, they're driven by a desire for a feeling of importance, there are a lot of, of those in the corporate world. Oh, yeah. They might be the ones that speak up in a meeting. They might be the ones who say nothing for a while and then raise their voice kind of awkwardly loud in a meeting. It's not because they're a jerk. It's because in that moment, they don't know it, but they're feeling insignificant. So there are actions we can take to bring people into the conversation to, to ward that off. Very tiny, small change in behavior. It doesn't mean you have to go up to the person afterwards and say, what's really going on and making an awkward situation of it. You can just understand that that's how that person functions and bring them into the conversation. So needs is one of them. Okay. Another big one is, is um, something I borrowed from the great Terry Reel, um, the family therapist, is the relationship grid. This is actually where esteem and boundaries meet and creates four quadrants. And these are the locations we go to when we're triggered. For instance, I will self-diagnose um, <coughs> here. I go up and left. I go grandiose and walled off when I'm triggered. I become, I know better, who do you think you're talking to, how dare you, and shut down and not let someone in. It doesn't happen very often, but that's where I go. Okay. So I can understand how to manage that, because I know when I've been triggered, and the antidote for that is the exact opposite. Bring the walls down, and come down off your high horse back to the center of health. So I can manage myself in a situation to not be a grandiose brick when someone triggers me. That makes me a better leader. Yeah. Similarly, when I see someone else get triggered and maybe they go down into shame and across into being walled off, you can hold space for them. You can ask thoughtful, intelligent questions. You can remove judgment from your tone to help that person come back up to health. These are different frameworks that we just need to know as, as leaders that that's what's going on in the human brain so that we can be more understanding. The neuroscience of leadership, huh? 
Yeah, for me, that's what it, and it just, it starts with, what's really going on here? With yourself and with others. I, I honestly, Dave, I don't think it has to be more complicated than that. So the first step is, you, is it checking in with yourself and see where am I, how am I reacting? How am I responding? For sure, it, okay. it has to be because, in my humble opinion, because we are no use to anyone when we are in our limbic system, when we're triggered, when we're stressed. Like how many times have you or any of your listeners ever been triggered by something and some seemingly small problem has seemed insurmountable? Oh yeah. And then 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, we think to ourselves, what was I worried about? That's because we went limbic. Yeah. We went into that fight or flight response and frankly, we're no use to anyone in that state. So absolutely, Dave, it starts with us. Because at the end of the day, man, that's the only thing we can control. Okay, so then for, for the benefit of everybody watching and listening, to, to get to that spot where you do that check-in, where am I? I'm in the upper left-hand quadrant. I've got to bring yeah. myself back down. You've got to do that instantaneously in the circumstance, right? You do, and it's just like working out. Like the first time you went and did deadlift or the first time you tried to arm curl whatever, it hurt and it was difficult and you failed. Okay. But the beauty of these tools is they're so impactful. You can start practicing them badly now and you'll notice a difference in yourself and in the relationships around you. That's the beauty of this. There is no perfect. There is no perfect. I don't think the point of this is to be ideal. It's just to be better. To be better so that you can then respond in that situation, but you've got to do it quickly. And I think I hear you talking about a muscle memory situation yeah. where if you do the work, you do the reps, when you're you know, in the game, so to speak, it'll come back to you. So talk a little bit more about that the work that we can do. Does artificial intelligence have any impact on any of this? I mean, sure. In, in, in businesses themselves, I, I guess there's a bunch of things that, we, c we can rely on robots, for want of a better phrase, to make decisions for us. But what I actually think is important is to lean into how we can use it to better serve people, if that makes sense. And, and actually what we're doing, we're discovering that a lot of our clients, what they, what they want to learn these, as I call them, pillars, this yeah. kind of like fundamentals of human behavior, neuroscience 101, is they want self-directed study. They don't necessarily want some guy with an English accent standing up on stage telling them how they should do it. They want someone to point them in the direction of what to go study. And what we discovered with a lot of our clients is that not only do they want it to be self-directed, but they want it to be tailored. They want it to be, well, something's different for Dave than it is for Devon. And depending on how I respond to a particular piece of content, I might want to go in a different direction. So we're actually harnessing the power of AI to build an online learning platform that responds to you and directs your path through our content, which is pretty cool. That is pretty cool because when you talk about doing something that's a, a, a course and, and you want it tailored, uh, I don't know if that exists, does it? Uh, not that I've seen, not that I've seen, um, and I think another benefit of it, like let's use the relationship grid as an example. I mentioned up and left because that's, that's where I go when I get triggered. There might be people listening who go there too, and that's relevant for them. But what about the other three quadrants? Yeah. I don't want to have to learn everything. So I, I want you to tell me what you think I need to know, which is what, you know, frankly, coaches and therapists do. Right. But how do you access that information on your own time, in your own way? And how do you create your own adventure? You know, like those books when we were kids, the, depending right. on how you answer question one at the end of chapter one, it tells you where to go. That's what we're building. And that will be on your website at some point? It, it will be. We're actually okay. we're, we're piloting it now, but very, very small, because there's going to be there's going to be bumps in the road and, and, and things to work out. But yeah, that, that will absolutely be. We'll, we'll be announcing it on LinkedIn. It will be on the website. And, and we'll be inviting particip participants to come and, and, and do the first wave. Well, I know we'll all be eager to hear what the results are in terms of the data that you're collecting and, and the themes that you're getting from that work. but. Are you able to share with us today any of the themes that you've seen so far in, in what you've been doing, you know, absent this AI system? Yeah, for sure. It's, I mean, two, I'll give you three. Two of the three are boundary, definitely internal, yeah. uh, boundary deficiencies, um, for sure esteem-based issues. And by the way, I don't just mean low self-esteem, I also mean an inflated sense of, of, ah. of worth at times. If you think about classic therapy, it helps people come up from toxic shame. But what about grandiose people? Let's help them come back down to earth. Yeah. 
okay? In, in a loving way, there's, there's a center of health. So definitely boundaries, definitely esteem. And the other one is, ju is just the stress response, Dave. Like, I know it's here to stay. I know it's part of our two million year old brain. And it, in my humble opinion, is what causes a lot of the arguments, a lot of the upset at work, and a lot of the poor decisions we make. Because I don't, know about you, I don't want to speak for you. If, if I'm stressed, if I'm triggered, I'm no use to anybody. I need to clean up my state before I think, say, or do anything. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could talk about a couple of little, little tips? Yeah, no, absolutely. Because, and let me just frame it up a little bit because everybody I think understands that the stress impacts not only your mental health, but your physical health and your relationships. It's, it's everything. Yeah, so I mean, how many times have you said something and an hour later you've gone, I really wish I hadn't said that. Yes, well, so please. Share with us. Maybe, can I give you a little, a little, little diagram? So that, pretend this fist here is your brain, okay? So buried in here, the tip of my thumb is the amygdala, the, the, the fear center of the brain. Around there is the limbic system, which is just basically emotion. And at the front here is our prefrontal cortex. This is where our logic and our theory and our thoughtfulness comes from. When we get triggered, the hat goes up and we go limbic. And we need to learn, and it's pretty obvious when you think about it, we need to learn in the moment to realize that we flipped our lid. Yeah. That's, where, that's probably where that saying comes from, actually. I like it. And we've gone limbic. And you know that you've gone that way because the things you're thinking in your head are so extreme. You know, you're really judgy about someone. You think it's an absolute disaster. And we need to bring the lid back down and actually think more thoughtfully about it. And people are going to roll their eyes when I say this, but there's two ways that I think are the best to do it. One of them, breathing. Yeah. It, I, everyone says it, and it's because it's true. And the second one is about re-engaging that prefrontal cortex. So maybe I go into both of those in a little more detail. Yeah, because I, what I know, which is enough to be dangerous, is the breathing brings you back to the present moment. But yes, please. Yeah, the way uh, I would, f I guess it depends on the situation, how I'd frame it, but how I feel compelled to describe it now is we have fundamentally two, two set points in our central nervous system. So we have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system response. So one is fight or flight, one is stay and play, right? I want to be down here. That's where I'm right. thoughtful, considerate, kind, open, creative. That's, that's the good stuff. And when I'm here, I think everything's a saber-toothed tiger and I'm just going to run or fight or freeze. So when we breathe in, we ever so slightly increase our heart rate, ever so slightly. And when we breathe out, we ever so slightly reduce our heart rate. That creates something called heart rate variability, meaning it changes the gap ever so slightly between heartbeats, which pushes us into the parasympathetic nervous system response. It chills us out. So if you just take a juicy inhale, and here's the key for me, my body might be different to everyone else's, I don't think it is, breathe out really slowly and just enjoy and savor a juicy exhale. And maybe do that twice, and you'll just feel ugh, the relaxation enter your body. Like, Dave, that's it. I know it's weird if you're in a meeting and someone says something that triggers you to then suddenly you know, sit there and do breathing, but you can do it subtly. You can do it, yes, in that moment. That's a great tip because you can do it anywhere. Yeah, And nobody has anywhere. to know it, see it. But what happens for most of us, myself included at times, by the way, like I, I mess this stuff up, is before we do that, our mouth opens and we say something, <laughs> right? And, we, and we've, we've thrown the grenade, the, the damage is done. So I would argue, shut up until you've got that under control. The second thing is to, to actually engage the prefrontal cortex, to bring the lid back down, yeah. so to speak, is ask yourself this question. I love this question. Do I need to be in fight or flight over this right now? Do I need to be in panic mode? And the beauty of that question is you have to think about it. You have to actually process that as a question which re-engages the part of your brain you want to. And 99 times out of 100, the answer you'll give yourself is, well, no. And that alone will calm you down. Interesting. I, in, in terms of getting the breath work and responding in that moment, uh, somebody else I, I read or heard recommended counting backwards from five. Five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Any thoughts on that? Does that help? Yeah, for sure it does. I mean, th the way I would describe that is that it is, I think it's Mel Robbins. Yes. Um, is it puts 
these are not her words, these are my words. It puts space between you and the thing, the incident, the person, the situation. And space is a good thing because it gives us time, it gives us a gap, it gives us an opportunity to respond wisely rather than react blindly. Yeah, and, and look, all of this resonates because I think everybody watching and listening has heard from their parents at some point growing up that before you open your mouth, if you feel like you're gonna respond, count to 10. Yeah. So, I mean, somewhere in all of this is the pause, catch your breath, reflect briefly. Yeah. Uh, Devin, we're coming down to the short strokes here, just a few more minutes to go in the program, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the difference between emerging leaders versus the seasoned leaders. Are, are, mm. I imagine there's some interesting distinctions there, and in about three and a half minutes, I'm gonna let you give us as much as you can. I love that you asked about that, thank you. So what, thus far, I've worked primarily with what I would call established leaders. I don't mean that in a grandiose sense, I just mean folks who have, have had blessed careers and are, are in positions of authority and, and, and leadership. And helping those individuals think differently, act differently, enjoy themselves at work is a gift. I realized, however, comma space, that if, if we're really gonna change the corporate world, if we're really gonna end suffering in the workplace, we need to reach people who are on their way up and teach them a new way. Just like family dysfunction rolls through generation to generation, so does toxic leadership. Yes. So let's, let's teach the, forgive me for sounding um, funny, but the, the youngsters, that's patronizing, teach the, the, the folks who are on their way up a different way of being and leading so that 10, 15 years from now, when you and I might be retired somewhere sipping cocktails together in Maui, the, the corporate world's a different place because the people who have come up under them have learned the new way and they're now in positions of authority running things differently. That's the point where I put my hand out and say, do you want to do things differently? Those are the people I primarily serve today. Yeah, and, and they're the ones that really need it the most. And I think the good news is they want a different world. They, they've seen what corporate America looks like and, and they don't want to be constrained in those same boundaries and in that game. Right. But there's a stat that I, I mentioned in one of my books about when mm. some, the, the average age that someone's promoted to a manager in the US is 31. Yeah. And the average age in which they get their first leadership training is 42. <laughs> yeah. So they've got a decade to screw it up and <laughs> just presumably with leaders who have given them bad role models. Yeah. So, what advice do you have for those emerging leaders who see a better way, want to do it, but may not be in a situation where they've got the support from the old guard in about 60 seconds? Ask for help. Find someone who has the result you want. I think it all comes down to modeling. At the end of the day, there are, even, even in the kind of older gang, there are leaders that are inspiring and wonderful today. So it's possible. Remember that, that it is possible. I don't want to say anything's possible, but anything's possible. So just know that it's going to be okay and look, ask for help, don't be afraid to ask for help. Find someone who has the result you want and model their behaviors. Doesn't have to be me, doesn't have to be one of our programs, but find someone, there is a different way. And the second thing I would say, because this really hurt me for some time is, you have time. That insecure overachiever in me who believes he's not as far ahead as he should be is always in a rush. And I think I'm too old or missed the boat or what, that's nonsense. It is never too late to reinvent yourself. So just know that it's okay. There's another way and go ask for help and you have time. You have time on your side. You will figure it out. Good stuff. Devin, tell folks watching and listening how they can get in touch with you. I would love for you to reach out to me through LinkedIn. Come and find me at uh, Devin Bailey um, or devinbailey.com. We have our swanky new website so you can reach out to us there and read more about what we do there. Do check out his swanky new website because I do think when someone's speaking with an English accent, they are much smarter than I am. So, Devin, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we are out of time. It goes fast here, but thanks so much for being with us today on Behind the Numbers. Thanks for having me, Dave. That's uh, great. I'm really, really thrilled that you're here for episode number 200. And thank you at home for watching and listening. We can't do this show without you. There will be more episodes coming soon. As a reminder, I'm Dave Bookbinder, and I'm the one that my clients reach out to when they want to know what their most important assets are worth. If you've been told that you need to know what the value of your business is or just want to know for strategic planning purposes, definitely reach out. I am happy to have a conversation with you. You can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Do hit the subscribe button and stay in touch with all that we're up to here on Behind the Numbers. We look forward to being in touch with you again soon with some new episodes. That's all for now, folks. We will see you next time on Behind the Numbers. Take care.